Hello guys, let's talk about a new topic today. That is the Leventhal Paradox. Before I go into this topic in detail, let me just introduce about the Leventhal. There was a scientist, his name was Cyrus Leventhal. He thought about the various conformation of the protein while folding it can take in. So it is going to be huge in number. So that was uh, a thought process put in by the Leventhal and the huge number of the conformation that he talked about, how exactly the folding is going to take place in a cell or in the cytoplasm of a cell or any other part in the eukaryotic cell or it is in the prokaryotic cell. That is the huge task. And uh, gradually the scientists came across and solved those problems. Though Enfinson was another scientist, he proved a vital role in explaining how exactly the protein folding is going to take place. I will not go in the very detail of the protein folding, but I have to talk about the certain basics which is required to explain the Leventhal paradox. Let's go into that and uh, see this video and this lecture till very end. We will come across with the many insights into the protein biochemistry. Let's start with. So this is the Leventhal paradox, today's topic. So first let's go into the protein folding. So every protein synthesized once, it is going to be in a linear form and gradually it occupies the 3D structure where it is going to be functional. It could be the primary structure, which is going to be turned into the secondary tertiary, or if it is more than one unit, it's going to be in the quaternary structure. This is how the protein is going to be folded and every protein that is going to be folded in the very end, it depends upon the what kind of primary structure in the beginning it has. So once the protein is uh, folded completely, it is called as native structure. And this process takes few milliseconds to take place. Now, how exactly the folding depends? I told you like the kind of uh, amino acid sequences a protein is going to have and the kind of amino acid in those sequences it is going to have will define exactly how the this primary structure is going to help. There was a scientist as I told you before in the beginning, uh, Christian and Fessin, he worked on an enzyme. We'll talk about, you know, in the little later on, he spoke about all the protein folding process depends on the primary structure and it is a thermodynamically driven process. Uh, in the end of structure, which is going to be formed, will have the minimum energy. That means the minimum entropy as well. So different kind of amino acid, which is there in the primary structure, be it the hydrophobic amino acid or the polar amino acid. So it is all very, very important. Roughly, the hydrophobic amino acids are going to be inside and the polar amino acids are going to be on the surface, which plays a very important role once this protein come across uh, with the water. There are the certain bonds which is present. All these bonds you are going to see in the tertiary structure onwards. In the primary structure, there'll be just the peptide bond, which is a kind of covalent bond. In the secondary structure, we have just along with the peptide bond, we have the hydrogen bond, where, which can fold the protein into the alpha helix and the beta peptide structure. It may also turn into some super secondary structure as well. Whereas in the tertiary onwards, we have the all these four bonds which is shown over here. One is a disulfide bond, which is because of the cysteine residue, which is having the sulfidyl uh, groups, which upon the oxidation will form the disulfide linkage, which is a kind of covalent bond. Then we have the hydrogen bond. Basically, uh, many amino acid is going to be involved in that. Uh, serine and the uh, glutamine shown over here, but there'll be many other amino acids which can take part in the making of the hydrogen bond. Then the salt bridges, which is an anionic bond, which is because of the positive and negative terminus. And then we have the hydrophobic interaction, which is again a very, very important bond, which includes the London dispersion forces, DIY forces, and maybe some other hydrophobic interactions as well, which are uh, which are the weak interactions.
but in the biological system those forces are going to play a very very important role and protein wouldn't be an exception so all this structure that is how it is going to be formed the first insight came from a, an indian scientist uh, professor g m ramachandran that you can see in the photograph and uh, along with this association he design and uh, he described the various kind of secondary structure with the kind of amino acid it, it can form he had given a plot where it has the four part and it talk about the certain angles are uh, we call diagonal and angles pi and psi which are very very important and those angle uh, arise from the peptide bond look at this angles we we'll talk about this is the plot i was talking about you can see the psi and the phi on the each axis which is shown from the minus 180 to plus 180 that means it talks about the 360 degree you know uh, conversion or the you know movement in those angle and let me first introduce you what are the phi angles you can see over here the cn bond shown over here and this bond the one which is shown in the red is the psi and one which is shown in the blue is the phi let's come to the leventhal paradox so exactly these bonds are having some rotation and the uh, the certain rotation which is possible certain rotation which are not possible based on the steric hindrance levin leventhal he talks about those problems which could relate with the protein folding he just talk about like a simple amino protein which is made up of some 100 amino acids and each amino acid if it is having just three possible conformation then the entire protein fold into the 5 into 10 to raise to uh, power 47 possible conformation and it takes only 10 raise to power 13 of a second to try conformation it would take around 10 raise to power 27 years huge huge time obviously these process will not take that much of time how we can calculate that let's talk about it so we assume a protein molecule has the n number of the amino acid that each residue has the two bonds capable of the rotation that is the phi and psi and if there are three possible conformation so each rotable bond in the backbone maximum number of the possible conformation is going to be 3 raised to power 2n and which is approximately 10 raised to power n and since each bond can rotate completely in about 10 raised to power 13 seconds it has been calculated total time it requires for a single bond in the backbone to rotate once in about 2 into 10 power minus 13 second therefore the time required the peptide chain to try out every possible conformation just i spoke about it is going to be t rest t is equal to 10 rest power n or which is going to be 2 n into 10 power minus 13 for a polypeptide of the six residue the time is going to be in the microsecond for for a chain of the 11 amino acids is going to be 0.2 second but a chain of 100 residue it will take 2 into 10 power 89 second huge huge hopping time it will take longer is the age of the earth it the staphylococcal nucleus this is an enzyme which has 149 residue requires almost 0.1 to 0.2 second how why the chain folds so quickly into the native conformation there's something else which is happening there so there was uh, this is going to be supported by the enfisin in his experiment what he did was he took one enzyme that is the ribonuclease i just spoke about and which is showing the four disulfide bond and those are going to be broken with the help of the eight molar of the urea and beta mercaptoethanol which is you know the going to break those disulfide linkages as a result you can see in the diagram this is going to be converted into the random coil which does not show any kind of activity now this denature reduce ribonuclease again once we uh, do the dialysis that is i mean done by the intestine and remove all those uh, urea and the mercaptoid ethanol from the solution and provide air to again reform the disulfide linkages disulfide linkage formation is oxidative reaction where the hydrogen is going to be removed 
whereas the breaking of those is going to be reduction process. After the renaturation, refolded protein has a native activity despite the fact there are the 105 different ways to renature the protein. That means something, some motifs are there, some codes are there which can lead to the formation or the folding of the protein in a particular way, which is the most feasible thermodynamically as well. And the protein folding is a kind of reaction you can see where the, in the beginning, if you look at the native structure has the minimum free energy. Whereas when the mutation occur, they will go to the transition state. So the protein is going to be partially folded or it can be denatured or can be misfolded as well, which could lead to the several diseases, including the Alzheimer as well. And this can be explained by a folding funnel, which is shown over here, like you know, at the top, you see a lot of entropy, but at the bottom where the protein is going to be finally folded, will have the minimum entropy. <clears throat> and the two enzyme which is helping in the process, one is a protein disulfide isomerase, which helps in the binding of the disulfide linkages and resuffling it as well, which can you know the uh, make a thermodynamically feasible 3D structure of a protein. Then another enzyme is the PPI, that is a peptidyl polyl isomerase, which accelerate the cis and trans isomerization, and it can increase this process 300 you know times, and uh, they convert this peptide bond which is no longer a planar bond. So <clears throat> this cis and trans of the proline is going to be very very important role it is going to play, and in the process there are certain molecular saprons or the and the saponins as well that I have not uh, uh, mentioned about, they are going to play important role. Other than that, there are some heat shock proteins, which also get activated during the protein folding, and they're going to play a very important role. So there's a variety of the heat shock protein. They also play very important role in the folding of the protein. Hopefully you enjoy this uh, video. Do share it, subscribe it, and write your comment. And just let me know what you want in the next lecture and do have if you have any kind of queries you can ask in the comment box thank you for hearing me thanks a lot